work. It's actually two minutes past. So my name is Derek Garfield. I'm the current vice president of the Utah International Mountain Forum here at UEU. We're so grateful to have you all here in attendance with us, with our esteemed guest, Marsha Barlow. Yeah. And she's here to talk to us a little bit about how to advocate at the UN level. Um, as you know, we're go to the UN Commission on Status of Women. It's the 62nd session, and we're very excited to do this. And uh, Ms. Barlow has been in attendance how many sessions now? Well, I've been doing this for almost 20 years, yeah, so, so she, I have been a few of Right, okay, so yes, uh, she's 20 years of experience. She's the Vice President of the International Programs for the United Families International. Um, she's done monitoring and educating at UN conferences and commissions in various parts of the world. Marcia is a lead policy analyst and a writer for United Families International and an author of the UFI, again, United Families International series, Guide to Family Issues, and directs the development and updating of the UN Negotiations Guide. She holds a master's degree from Harvard University at the Kennedy School of Government, where she specialized in public administration and public policy issues. Well, Marcia is also married to Greg Barlow, and they have three children and six grandchildren. So that's just a little bit about our guests. Um, and we do have several events with Marcia throughout the day. Um, they're kind of specialized, but uh, we what the plan is is to have her speak to us for about 40, 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll get in a few questions at the very end just to address any specific <coughs> concerns that, that you have for her expertise. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. Good to be with you. I will apologize in advance because to condense 20 years and into 30, 40 minutes is, is a challenge. But when I first went to the UN, I was with some colleagues, and I remember walking into the building and looking around and being so totally overwhelmed. And I was like this little kid. I just kind of patted around after the one person seen was large and in and out and seriously it took about three maybe three years for me to get the lay of the land in just that building alone because it's so disjointed so in, in preparing for this my thought was to avoid the deer in the headlights look and to have you not be fogging around what would I have appreciated if someone would have told me all those years ago so I'm going to condense as best I can that information into this presentation. So this is what I wish someone would have explained to me. When you look at advocacy in general, and particularly at the UN, you have three things that you need to keep in mind. And I, I wanted to give you a structure and break it down so it was easier to understand. You can see the three things there, goals slash ideology relationships, documents, and the language of all of the international treaties, conventions, commissions, before we do that, I want to just give you a basic overview, overview of the UN. I don't know about you, but that chart makes me crazy. It's so yeah. big. So I, there is only one thing that we deal with directly, and that is the Economic and Social Council. And you can see that line right there. How it, so that's it. But other than that, we're moving on, because this is what you really need to know. If you want to impact the language and what's happening at the UN with the diplomats, you need to pay attention to the various committees. All of the missions, the delegations, usually have a position where they're asked to oversee. The thing that we, mostly with the ECOSOC issues, we deal with second and third committee. You can see what they deal with. You will, in some of the smaller missions, run into diplomats that actually, and delegates that actually deal with all six of those. And you can imagine how overwhelming that is if you were trying to cover all of the meetings that take place in the UN and you had to be over all of those. But again, the second and third committee is when you meet with diplomats, try to find out who on their delegation work with that. The easiest way to look at the issues I assume that you would be looking at is to look at the various commissions. You have the Commission on Social Development, otherwise known as CSOTB, UN Islamic Acronyms. It's held in February every year. 
Status of Women, held in March every year. Commission on Popular Day, Population and Development, held in April. This is a new one on the bottom, the High Level Political Forum, HLPF, that it was put in place, takes place in July, it's put in place to oversee the implementation of the SDGs. If you want access to diplomats, I highly recommend the HLPF. CSW, very, very crowded, close to 5,000, 6,000 people come into New York for that. Social development, much smaller. CPD, much smaller. So don't fixate necessarily on CSW, Commission on Status of Women, because there are multiple commissions that you can go and have your voice be heard. Just this is one thing no one ever explained to me. Each one of these commissions, and there, there are more, this is just New York we're talking about, has a foundational document. You can see the social summit, which took place in Copenhagen, CSW, World Conference on Women, and CEDAW is are the documents that they draw from. That's relevant because when <coughs> you are doing helping with negotiations and trying to insert language, you need to look to those documents. You can see ICPD, which took place in 1994. Here's another confusing thing. When people at the UN talk about documents, they might be talking about the social su summit. Guess how they refer to it? Copenhagen. They might be talking about ICPD, but they'll say Cairo. So it tends to be confusing. It's to your advantage to understand what these foundational documents are, because that's that's how they will communicate. So what is CSW? Fundamental Commission, been in existence since 1946. So this is this, the 62nd session of the commission. You can do the math on that. Came into prominence in 1995, at the time that became the landmark anchor document for CSW. And you can, it's used to promote the values and understanding. So you hear a lot of references to Beijing because that's what CSW harkens back to. So we're going to talk about goals for a minute. I assume everyone in this room has goals. Mountain Women Forum and the group have goals. Usually goals are backed by some form of an ideology, ideology if you will. That's where your worldview comes from. And you will find many, many people with differing worldviews different goals, they, for the most part, everyone at the UN has a, a common goal, which is to better humankind, to help people around the world flourish. The means that you get to helping people flourish, the methods, the solutions, vary greatly. And just be well aware of that, that again, everyone who comes to the UN has an agenda. I have an agenda. You have an agenda. Everyone has an agenda. And also understand that the UN itself has an agenda. I used to picture the UN as a uh, fan of Camelot. And UN, in my mind, the metaphor was the Knights of the Round Table. We're all going to sit down and we're going to have this conversation. We're all hopefully going to be moving towards the same goal. It doesn't quite work that way because of different ideologies, worldviews, and different agendas. So, just put that out there. We might talk about that briefly, but no, that's the case. Always, almost always good intent. With that in mind, I'm not going to go into this, but it is very fascinating to understand how the difference in worldview forms. Jonathan Haidt out of NYU, um, sociologist who's written a book, The Righteous Mind, he does TED Talks. And I would highly recommend this book, but just one quick overview. He talks about that people as a whole respond to these six things. Picture it as taste buds on your tongue, and you might be able to taste salt or sweet or whatever it is. Each one of those is a taste. And people on the left end of the spectrum respond to the first two. Care, compassion, and every once in a while liberty, but the, their understanding of liberty would be different. Than, the, than someone on the right or the conservative perspective who respond, they have taste buds for all six. They can react and they appreciate and value all six. Again, these two right here form the basis of a more liberal left worldview. And 
we could talk, and I'd be happy to chat with someone afterwards, but it would, it would be a fun conversation. Just understand that the less liberals' highest values are these three things. <coughs> Conservatives' highest values are those three things. Not going to make a value judgment one way or another. Just, just understand it exists. And it might make help things make more sense at the UN and in the world as a whole. So, relationships. Why relationships? The basis of advocating is developing relationships. You, you don't have the power to influence unless you have a relationship with someone. And when I talk about the various <coughs> thing, groups or people that relationships you need to develop when you are doing UN advocacy. The most obvious one is diplomats. You need to <coughs> deliver your message, deliver your solution, deliver your worldview, and, and the goal for my organization, the goal is we're a policy organization. We want to impact those documents because those documents are providing the basis for an international body of law and also the programming, the funding, and the things that happen at the UN, right down to the budgets, are directed by the language coming out of those documents. So it's important to everyone and it will, we're going to spend some time on that. Mission visits, these are some of the ways that you can meet delegates or diplomats. There is a protocol to mission visits, and I know, Ambassador, you did a mission visit last year. Uh, yes, and, and this time also. And this time also. There, the protocol is that you need to, used to be you had to fax, and fax, and fax, and fax. A request to the ambassador to meet with the, someone in their mission. They, then you wait for them to respond, they rarely would, so you call and call and call. That's still the protocol. You need to either fax or email a letter requesting a time to meet with someone. Then keep keep calling. And I we have a UN training manual that I'll share that actually what do you do when you do a mission visit? What how what do you say? What do you talk about? And I'll get that to you. How many are familiar with the UN Blue Book? Anybody know what that is? Not yet. The Blue Book is a directory of all of the missions and all of the offices it has. And it literally is a little blue book. Right now it's online. I don't even know that they print it anymore. But if you Google UN Blue Book, you will gain access to all of the pertinent information information regarding each one of those missions. Their address, facts, phone numbers, people's names, titles, and um, personal phone numbers, personal emails, all in the blue book. Very, very important. Get a copy of that blue book. A lot of meeting with diplomats is happenstance. You might sit down in the Vienna Cafe and you will run into a diplomat. Relationships, develop them, talk to people, engage. Diplomats sometimes are a little guarded, and particularly during CSW because there's just so many people. But generally, it's not a problem to sit down at a table with someone or to chat with someone in the hall. Meet them at the elevator, say, hey, can we go to lunch? One of the best ways to meet diplomats. Parallel and side events. In terms of diplomats, do I need to explain parallel and side events? Here's the difference. Everyone gets nervous and anxious about this. Parallel events are outside the UN. They're long in buildings, <coughs> generally close to the UN. They are NGOs or non-governmental organizations that sponsor these parallel events. Inside the UN complex is side events. To get a side event, you have to have a connection to a country. They have to apply, and in, in terms of which is better, if you want to meet with diplomats and get your message into diplomats, whatever you're presenting at the parallel or side event, you want to be inside UN at a side event because the odds that you'll get a diplomat there are much higher than out on the street at a parallel. Even though the parallel events are highly attended, well attended, but mostly NGOs. But you invite people to your parallel events, that's the chance to get your message out. One interesting thing that's evolved over the last few years are forms or retreats. Now, diplomats, the delegates are super busy. They don't have a lot of time to give to you and your message. One way to do it, there is there are several groups, they literally hold retreats. For example, one group in Arizona, um, they Arizona in the winter, Phoenix in the winter. Yeah, everybody in New York's really happy to be treated to a trip to Arizona. And they come, and these organizations spend their budget doing a three-day conference where they 
talk to them about their message and their agenda and their goals and what they would like to see put into the documents language-wise. So I don't know what you, you you've done it for Mountain Women Forum. Can we? I'm an ambassador also for our kind of office of See, global engagement. Exactly. International you are doing exactly that thing. That is one of the very, very best ways to have them away from their busy schedule and have their attention. On-site exhibitions. That's a new thing that we've discovered. Um, most of the commissions, CSW not so much because it's so big, but if you want to meet diplomats and get your message out, Exhibitions, the UN offers them, and like if you go to the registration page for CSW or for C, not CSW, but CSW or CPD, those two commissions, there'll be a, a line that says exhibitions, and you can request an exhibition, which means in the hall, usually by the main cafe, Vienna Cafe, you have a table, just like this one, and you set up and you put all of your materials out, and people will walk up, have candy on the table, and get them to come. And they will come and talk with you. You can explain your programs, you can give them brochures, you can give them information, and you can have some really great conversations. And the extra good news is it's free. And it's usually not hard to do. So I the leadership, I would take a look at on-site exhibitions. Particularly at the high-level political forum, great opportunity. Very few people there, so who's going to walk up to your table usually is high-level people who are at the high-level political forum. Um, oral and written statements, um, UVU, your group is already doing an excellent job. That's one way to let your voice be heard. They will literally give you a microphone, which is the end all at the UN. In a big public forum in one of those conference rooms to get your hands on a microphone. In Geneva, get your hands on a microphone. Oral statements difficult to get an oral statement because everyone wants to do it and there's only time and when they say two minutes or three minutes they mean it they don't so much in new york and in geneva they tell you two minutes at two there's a clock and at two minutes they cut off the mic so keep them short and and you can have a lot of impact with an oral statement written statements if you're some of the first groups that submit your statement will actually pub be published in the UN record and show up. Yes? May we ask questions as you go on? Um, should we hold them to the end? Yeah. But, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to answer those. What, what the issue that Eddie, he has uh, not yeah, so much ahead. time and he would... So, uh, with, with so many statements being made mm -hmm. at that time, and everybody's putting in their two-minute statements, um, how do they... Categorize. How, do How do they prioritize that? Because all of the statements sounds good. Are you talking about the oral statements? The oral statements. That's a great question, and I have no idea. It almost is. There is usually a UN person that oversees the oral statement. So let's say you submitted, they say you're going to give an oral statement. You have to come, and you will sit there all day long during the plenary sessions. You will sit there and you will just wait for them. And you may get a chance to give it, and you may not. And I have no idea. You have to just report in. I have no understanding of how they choose. If you have more NGOs on your paper as sponsors, the higher your odds. But I've, I've seen when they've had 20 people still not. They give it to Good news, young adults, younger people, usually get a mic easier. So that that put students <laughs> on it somewhere. That's very helpful. Oh, yeah, you should. Yeah. No the written statements, and they they go into I have no idea. I mean they're they're in the system somewhere, but they're hard to find unless you're one of the first twenty that submits, and then you can see it in the fancy UN template, and you now you feel very very important because it's there. But the, other than that, so you you have to make some judgments here. This is, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of money, and you will spend a lot of your time trying to figure out how to, how to best access the system. UPR, Universal Periodic Reviews, are done in, in Geneva. A really, it's a new thing that was put in place with the SDGs, but there's opportunity to have major impact with the UPR system. And come and talk to me afterwards if you're interested in that. That is something you can do from right here and have a major impact in Geneva at the Human Rights Council. So, quick, quick, quick. State Department and the equivalents in all these other countries. 
you know, it depends on who if the administration is. Let, we'll just talk to the United States. Depends on who is in the White House and who the State, State Department, what the composition is. If your ideology, your worldview lines up with the administration, you will have much better access into the State Department. And that State Department influences the U.S. delegation, who heavily influences the documents. So if you can get someone in another country at their capital, all of these delegates, when they are negotiating, they are in direct communication with their capitals. Ambassador, I don't know if you were ever a part of that scenario, but they they will, sometimes it's just that, that's nice, Marsha, I want to help you with your language, but my capital says no. Yeah, they, they use it that way. But they literally are going back and forth. There have been times when we, my organization has had the opportunity directly on the telephone with the State Department, the person who's pulling the strings and, and giving the direction to the U.S. delegation. But you, you have to be very connected one way, Again, contacts within a country, if you've got them, use them. If you know a minister in a country, make that connection and see what you can do. If, there's, if there is a document that's named being negotiated, you have words and phrases and things you want in there, get to your contacts. One interesting thing for CSW, a lot of these missions, these big ones, Germany, Canada, U.S., will have briefings as part of CSW. What that is, you need to contact that mission. So you folks are U.S., write this down. Her name is Peggy... Carrie. She's John Kerry's sister, and she is the State Department UN liaison. You write to Peggy Carey, ask me afterwards, and I'll get you her email, and you say, can I attend the U.S. briefing? They only let one person per organization, sometimes two, attend. Very interesting, because if you go inside the mission, they will sit you down, they will tell you what their goals are for CSW. You will meet the delegation for CSW. Every, every commission will have different State Department people as part of the delegation. This CSW even has civil society people. They usually have a, a model or a Hollywood type celebrity on the US delegation. They will all be at the briefing and you get to ask questions and you get to give input. So it's a great opportunity to get your voice heard directly to your delegation, assuming you're a US citizen. And the end all is actually get yourself on a delegation. You say, how, how could that be? Happens a lot. If you know someone in a country and you have the credentials and the expertise, a lot of these countries are very, very small. And they might have only three people in New York on their delegation. If you're a credentialed person and they know you and can trust you, they might accredit you and you will actually sit on the delegation. You will be in the room for the negotiation with the ability to take the mic and give input. So all of my colleagues, dream of someday being on a delegation and getting an opportunity to get hold of them during negotiations. UN agencies, who knows? Because you you have to know someone. UN Women, UNICEF, UNFPA, primary ones that are the UN agencies that deal with CSW. Um, internships, I have a lot of people say, can I go do an internship at the UN? As an undergrad, no. As a graduate student, yes. So. If you're interested, that's the way it works. The Bureau, every commission has a bureau, and it's comprised of countries. And if you know some of the people that are on the bureau, if you look on the CSW website down, scroll down, it will say bureau, and it should give you the members. It rotates, I think there's like 30 countries that are part of the CSW Bureau. And they have great influence. They're also good to get a side event if you've got someone on the bureau, and you can convince them to work to a side event, it works well. And now, all of us, we're NGOs, non-governmental organization. There are big UN NGO committees. CSW has a big one. They're super NGOs is what they are. We were just talking about that. But there are also NGO committees on the family. And these are the ones that I know because of our folks. Um, there are religious freedom. There's a, an NGO, a UN committee on that, and they meet monthly. They usually have a membership, and sometimes it's worth it because you, you get opportunities to get your message out that you wouldn't ordinarily have. See me afterwards, and I'll give you a more a long list of that. CSW, they have 
various caucuses that meet daily. And you can register as Mountain Women Caucus, and you can hold a meeting, and we will give you a room, which is like gold. So get NGOs together, form a caucus, and apply. That's one route. And then, of course, coalitions. And I was asked to talk about some of the various coalitions that might be in Utah. Um, think in terms of humanitarian groups. There are policy organizations. Worldwide Organization of Women, or WOW, um, escaping me, who else? United Families has a Utah, an Idaho, an Idaho and a Utah chapter, and they, they would be great partners. Sutherland, Days for Girls, I know that, again, look for anyone that's inter interested in hope, helping with a global solution, and join with them. You learn and you gain the ability to influence far more broadly if you're part of a coalition. And again, the parallel and side events are our opportunity as NGOs to get our message out. Security. Yeah, the guys that stand at the doors and let you through. They're important. Get to know them. They will be very helpful to you. And you can get in places that you ordinarily can't if you make an effort to know the security folks. Solves lots of problems. Um, also, just interesting on security, you think, when you think most security would be hired right there in New York, not the case. They have a regional mandate, a world regional mandate, and those security, um, the security <coughs> forces are from all over the world. All different languages. It's, it's very fun to engage them in conversations because they come from all over. I put up flyers and leaflets because one way to get your message out so you're at CSW, you have a particular thing you want to promote, and you want to talk to delegates. It used to be that you could stand in the hall with flyers and hand them out. That is the case no more. You, you'll get ex escorted out of the building very quickly if you did that. But you can stand with a flyer. Even for your parallel event, you want to promote your parallel event, you can't go in there and hand out flyers. No, no, no. But you can walk up to someone and you can say, hi, I'm Marcia, I, we're having this event, or Here's some language that I've worked up for this draft document. Would you, would you like this? And if they take it, then you can hand it out. Otherwise, no lift leaflet or security will get after you. What about the UN badges? What do they mean? They have, so I was meant to bring a badge. That if it has an S on the badge, that means they're from the secretariat. That means that's administrative, dare I say, bureaucracy. Probably, I mean, yeah. No reason to, if you want to get your message out, those aren't the folks. <coughs> just, I would stay away from the secretary. Um, delegate, yeah, you want to talk to them. A, a D, that's gold. Those are the folks that you really want to engage with, if possible. And N and, and is for NGOs and not, yeah, it's all of us and it's wonderful, but just so you understand, when glance at that badge, it used to be the badges would actually tell you what part of the, um, what country, or what organization for NGOs, what they would say on it, they don't, they just have the, that listed. Okay, so, now, language, oh, this is the hard part. Okay, think of these in terms of which has the most teeth. So, the top is the least amount of ability to enforce something and the Convention Treaty, the most ability to enforce. So I'm going to talk quickly about resolutions. You'll see lots of them. The resolutions communicate UN business. They are non-binding. They try to get consensus, but they're non-binding. And it's, it's more for structuring policy and directing attitudes. And they're usually drafted as part of some conference. And countries can just um, unilaterally put a resolution together. They usually try to join with other countries because it looks better to have more. But I, I keep this list from CSW 2013. Those were all resolutions that were being negotiated during CSW in all of these various rooms. In addition to the main document, the outcome document, or it's called agreed conclusion, which is the, the one year everybody's interested the most in. But 
you, we, you don't ignore these. So match an admission that has four or five people. They've got to be in the plenary, which is the main session that takes place all through CSW. They need someone in each one of these resolution negotiations, and they need someone or a team in that main room for that outcome document. So that which speaks to if you actually could help a delegation, a country, you odds you, know, you might get on a delegation. Conference documents. That's what's going to be happening right now is these, every commission generates an outcome document. And you've seen that, it, the zero draft of that document was already released. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. These documents are non-binding, yet influential. But the ones that matter the most would be, okay, so Beijing was 1995, the big one. Commission, Fourth World Commission, or Conference on Women, or the Beijing Declaration. Five years later, in the year 2000, which is about time I got involved a few years before, they did Beijing plus five. Five years later, they did Beijing plus 10, Beijing plus 20. Those are big ones. You, if you can get to New York and be a part of that, those documents matter a lot. So what's happening? See, these are conference documents, ICPD, Beijing, a bunch of them. And then there's lower level conference documents that the one this year for CSW, yeah, matters, but not nearly as much as a five-year review. What they're doing in the United States, let's look at our legal system. We know that judges look to precedent, right? They, they look at past law, and they it's called precedent. Basically, what all these documents are doing is building an international precedent, a body of law, not binding, but it impacts other countries. It trickles down into their legal systems. That's why it matters and that's why people are there hammering over one word until the middle of the night. Conventions. We're getting into something that has more power. So, the way you know a convention, so resolutions, no teeth at all. Commissions and conference documents, just precedent. Conventions start getting a little more serious because they put a monitoring body with them. When you, as a country, sign on to a convention, you are committing to be reviewed every four years. You have to go before an unelected body, in the case of the Con Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against the <coughs> or CEDA. Your country, U.S. has not signed on to these, and there's, mm -hmm. there are reasons why. Um, you go before them, and they tell you what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. You have to report to them, then they give you a list of recommendations and put pressure on you to do X, Y, Z. That can be good and that can be bad. If you're a human rights violator, that's a good thing. You want to have that change. So it's all that they're binding to the degree that the country decides to comply. They refer to them as binding, but they're not nearly as binding as sometimes conventions and treaties, they use those terms interchangeable. But what you want is the one that really has the teeth, which means sanctions. So the law of the sea, the SALT, SALT Treaty, all that, and agreement on trades and tariffs, if there are actually the ability to issue sanctions, the UN has that, that's the ultimate in teeth. So conventions, lots, it depends. You can see some of them, CRC, CDOS, um, Rights of Persons with Disability, there's all your acronyms and here that they were put into force. In terms of the United States, a, some debate on this, but in our Constitution it says that a treaty, when adopted and ratified by two-thirds of the Senate, it becomes the law of the land. So it is rare that the United States Senate will ratify a UN treaty. Very, very few, because of that very reason. It's a sovereignty issue. It's not that they might not necessarily agree with what's in it, they may or may not, but they don't give up sovereignty and put themselves at the mercy of an unelect, unelected body. And that's that's it in a nutshell for CEDAW and all of those documents. Treaties, neither, again, remember they might use those terms interchangeably, but the, the real teeth is in that treaty. Thing. Consensus. That is the word. In a negotiation, they want everyone in the room to agree. It's really hard to do. 
know, we've got all these different worldviews competing, but they, they're going to try to get everyone to agree. And how it happens, are you, a document, let's, let's just walk through this process a minute. This zero draft just came out uh, like two weeks ago for this, for CSW. All of the countries in what they call an informal setting are allowed to give input. They will contact the chair and say, I would like to take paragraph three and add these words and delete these words. And before, right now, that document looks to be six pages long, the one that you can probably see. I just got yesterday the compilation draft where all of the countries gave their inputs, input on it. That document now is 40 pages long. Then the process begins, so everybody gives all their input, they go through it, they do the first reading, and some of it gets pared down, and then there's almost another round where, people, where diplomats and countries can put in more information. And that last week, CSW is two weeks long, that last week in a room somewhere, they will be in there hammering out that. They will go through that document word by word and they will leave the hard stuff to the end. It stays in a bracketed condition. And they'll try to negotiate and get it pared down, pared down, pared down, until you get to, what is it, March 22nd, Thursday night at midnight. That thing has to do, that document has to be finished, go before the General Assembly, before the Equisoc Bureau to be voted on. And it's still 32 pages long. Mm -hmm. And that's when the horse training begins and the language matters and they go back and forth and the most controversial stuff, because no one can agree, gets thrown out. The reason consensus is important, people say, well, don't, doesn't the UN even vote? I bring <coughs> them vote. They actually do have a board, you know, just like at the capitals, and, you know, go down to your capital and you'll see the board and Senator so-and-so voted this way. They have one and they rarely use it because they're trying to get consensus. If they don't reach consensus, the document has less value. Because some, a country that disagreed with what was in it would come back and say, that wasn't consensus. It was put to a vote. So it, it drops in importance. So everybody's after consensus. And there have been two times in the last eight years where documents have been thrown out completely. They never finished the document. After weeks and weeks and weeks of negotiation, it never was finished because they could never agree. And there's a lot of times where I cheer and say, well, good. <laughs> you know, no law is better than a bad law, kind of. You know, don't pass something or put in something in place that's not good. But that's bad for diplomats. They are paid to negotiate. And it's, it's viewed as a failure on their part when they don't reach consensus. So they're motivated. Those diplomats are motivated to get that document done. Remember, it's not the same. It's not going to look like what you see down at your capital or in Washington, D.C. The agreed conclusions I've just talked about, the drafting committee, who produces that zero draft? I have no idea. And I have talked to U.S. State Department top diplomats for the U.N. who really don't know. It, the process varies every single time. I explained to you the process of negotiations. Relationships here are important. If you want language in that document, you need to be able to communicate with either one country, two country, or multiple countries because they vote in blocks and influence that way. But you can't do it unless you can get your language to them. How, how do you even get your language? I, I know what I want in this document. I have it on this nice wire, but how do I get it in someone's hands? It used to be you could sit in the negotiations and actually watch them do it. You'd see who was saying what, and you could approach them as soon as the meeting closed. They hit the floor, and you run up to me and say, I noticed she said X, Y, Z, and I, have you ever thought about this type of language? And it was very doable. Now you're in the dark. The only way you know what's going on in that room is if you have a friend inside that room. And that's how you monitor. You have to get relationships. Words and phrases matter. You've got tons of language, and you're looking for consensus language. Consensus language means two years ago in a document, they, that was reached consensus. So what do I want to do? I want to take that language and insert it into the current draft. So how do you do that? A colleague of mine developed, it's called the UN Negotiating Guide. This is a big, thick book. We also have it on CD, and I'll leave it here for you. But most of this book is just a hands-on of most of the main documents that are dealt with with an ECOSOC. 
but the value is actually in the front of it where for my ideology and my worldview, we've taken it and broken it out and got the best language, best consensus language and put it in a form that's very, very usable. And when you're looking, I, I will pull up a draft. If we were to do this right now, let's just talk about it. I'll come back here. I would take, get that zero draft, and I'd have an Word document, I'd hit Control F. And then I'd start, these are words that are important to me in my organization. They may not be your word. And I would start searching and see where that language is in that document. Or even if it is, if it's not in there, then that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to promote that, those words and those phrases. And that's, that's the process. You get the, you know, I don't hardly look at the zero draft anymore because I know it's going to become 40 pages very quickly. But once that 40-page document is released, and you almost have to know someone that's willing to share the document with you, then I start doing this very thing. Control F and start seeing, and I start bracketing, and I start forming a framework of words. Then I'll take this negotiating guide, and I'll look at the consensus phrases, and I'll start trying to create language. I'm not saying this is for everyone. It's kind of a special ops kind of a thing. If you like the legalese, you might do this, but it's I was asked to tell you how to impact the documents. This is how you do it. And then you, you, you give them concrete suggestions. They're busy. And if you align with them in, in perspective, their odds are they'll take your language and they'll fight for it. So that's, that's how that part is done. Got your phone with you? Now I'm going to tell you um, another tool which I debated whether to tell you, it's this women, women's human rights. It is, we, we created this, like I said, about 18 years ago. And about four years ago, um, another group, probably ideologically on the other end of the spectrum, created their own version and put it in an app. And it's right there. If you go to your app store and look up women, you, women's human rights, a little red thing, you can go in and you'll see how they use the keywords and how they've indexed it. What I do like about this is they have some of the lesser documents like CSW 54. <laughs> They'll have that document. We don't have that in, in ours. We have the main one. And you're actually better off to work, but you'll see, when you see that draft, it'll have all of the UN acronyms at the bottom. That is those prior documents and their consensus. That's why they put them in there. So this just is a tool that will get that language at your fingerprint, fingertips. So again, don't be overwhelmed by that. If that's your gig, then, then do it for sure. Um, lastly, I just walked in. What am I going to do? You know, deer in the headlights, whoa. Walk in. You should have, in advance, looked in the UN Journal. Every single day, the UN Journal comes out and it's Big. Look for the echo sock bracket because you'll see Security Council, you'll see all sorts of things. In that will be all the informals. You'll know where those negotiations are taking place. Might not be able to get in, but you'll know. And you can wait outside the room if that's what you're planning to do. But everything that goes on in the UN inside that building is in that UN journal every day. Um, you walk in and there are electronic schedule boards. Take a look at those. Peruse those boards. There's one. Upstairs and one downstairs, so there's like three, you'll see them. Read those boards, they'll tell you where the side events are, tell you what's going on. Um, mention that. You'll also want to keep a running list of parallel events that you like, because those are outside and you might, well, I don't know, do you provide that to them? Do you go through? I take the list and I, for my UFI team, I say, this one needs to be monitored, this parallel event, this parallel event, I give them a list. So you're dividing your time between side events, parallel events, and what I didn't put up here is plenary. I'm stopping right now. And attend events, develop relationships, follow the no negotiations. Those are your options, but there's plenty to do, and I'll stop right there. You guys can do this. You've got this. You really can. Questions? I told you, drinking from a fire hose here. She's going to have time afterwards to talk a little bit too, but there is a, another group coming in. So do we have any quick questions for Marcia? Uh, too much information. <laughs> just, yes. just the other question. It, it, it seems that uh, the voice of the uh, nations is much stronger than NGOs. Whatever oh. the parallel event and whatever, 
you cannot get inside uh, uh, if you will not get uh, any kind of connections to the embassies. That's true. Correct? Yeah. To the missions. Unfortunately. Yes, unfortunately. unfortunately. That's why I say relationships. That's why people will go to such great lengths to have those retreats mm -hmm. and those forms and spend a lot of their budget on that. Because once they've got those people and they become friends with them and they're able to actually have dialogue and conversation and put forth worldview and do training, it's worth its weight in gold. Now you have a friend in the room, on the floor, who's going to give you information, who is going to put forward <coughs> language that you've suggested to them. Other than that, I don't know. You can make oral statements, you can make written statements, but you're, you're playing around the edges. Mm -hmm. It's happening in those negotiating rooms, those relationships. Uh, you see, we already submitted that uh, language for the uh, <coughs> zero draft, but they kicked us out. And uh, yesterday, they even made a recommendation to Yaku that go to the nations and talk to the uh, permanent uh, representatives. They could do it much easier. And they, if you have one, they will forward every two or three days the revised draft of those negotiations is kicked out to all the diplomats. you got to have somebody that will share that with you, or you're in the dark. You just don't know what's going on. Is that, am I answering your question? It, it, that, but there are other ways. It, it's a multi-pronged approach. Plenaries is, I didn't put that up there, I should have. They take place all day long, and it's speeches. It's country speeches, but they're worthwhile. Because if, I would, if you have a team there, I'd send someone into the plenary and have a monitor. Because I want to know what Chile's saying. It, it, it's their speech about what they think about CSW and the Beijing document. It's their commitment to women's rights. They're going to tell you in their speech. And you, you get a really good read on what, where these countries are coming from by attending that plenary. So put somebody in there, put someone in a side event, put someone in a parallel event. The idea is to cover as much and collect as much information as possible and get the relationships. And I'm not downplaying relationships with NGOs. That, that's important too. It's all, there's just a lot going on. So, again, too much information? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. So, so goals, relationships, and yeah. documents. But maybe uh, one more. Briefings uh, every day with... Uh, no, each, each, each of those main missions will have a briefing during CSW. But CSW in the mornings, 8.30. Oh, those are, those are, that's the NGO CSW briefing. Is it uh, interesting? No, no. Yeah, it's at 8.30 every morning. Um, you're putting me on the spot. You, you'll get a definite world view. And there's a classic example of a caucus. Mm -hmm. These people got together, formed a caucus, got a meeting, and they can have that every single morning. Those are good. They will bring in guest speakers. Some, I've seen them bring in the Secretary General, UN Secretary General. And they'll bring in the head of UNFPA. And so, no, they're worthwhile. They're very early. I generally don't get there. <laughs> we would like to go on Wednesday at 8.30 before they're already finishing everything. One of yeah, no, go to one of them, and they will talk about what's going on with the document. They actually will have a, usually have a dialogue, and they'll ask for input, so, and so some NGO will say, I was talking to so-and-so, and they're doing this, and on this paragraph, you'll get all that at that briefing. So, it, again, that's, that's, you know, you only have so many hours in a day, and so many people, you have to decide where you can have the most impact that you can collect good information at the briefing. And that's different. What I had up there, those briefings to get into those missions, first of all, it's very interesting. You, U.S. citizens to go to the U.S. briefing is fascinating. I highly recommend that you try and get in. You guys are going to appear when? When do you show up in New York? How many schedule? 18th. Monday. 16th. Sunday. Sunday the 17th? Uh, that we'll arrive on around the 17th through the 18th okay. to start on the night. Usually the U.S. briefing is earlier in the week. Really? Yeah. And try to get into the Canadian briefing. It's worth going. I've gone to the German briefing before. It's just interesting to go and hear what, what's happening in Australia as well. Um, 
Okay, so you're coming the second week. What you're going to see as compared to the first week, the first week has a lot more fair oil bands, a lot more going on, but the more substantive stuff in terms of negotiations takes place that second week. So how late will you be there? How many days? Depends on the person. It, it depends on the, yeah. So Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday I Friday, it depends. Okay, the real fireworks are Thursday night. And pretty much everyone stays up all night. But, but you will be the second uh, week there as well. Yeah? Pardon me, <laughs> you will be the second week, you will be there. I, I'm coming on the 12th. I usually am there for the full two weeks. This time I'm missing a couple of days at the beginning, but I'll be there for the full two weeks. But we will see you on uh, your second week. Yeah? For but sure. Maybe we can have a group photo yeah? because we have just a couple of minutes left. Yep. Every NGO, every country came to the table at the beginning of this process with specific goals that would most benefit their country and provide solutions. And so you merge all of that and distill it all down till we got the sustainable development goals. And you wanted your goal in there and what was important to you, otherwise you would have fallen off the world stage, so to speak. You needed that. So much, much of this and when you look at the SDGs, they have the targets that became very defined as the process went on. And just in the back, the back story right now is that the implementation and the indicators for the SDGs are being debated heavily. And the indicators have been established. You say targets, uh, and now I'm trying to remember how they explain what the goals are, what the targets are, what the indicators are. Indicators are how the countries communicate what they're going to use to measure the program. But money undergirds all of that. Focus undergirds all of that. You want your, what your goal and agenda is to be represented in that language. So again, goals, relationship, and the third one is the documents themselves. Um, for UVU and for those of you that might be going and just going forward, whatever amount of clarity you can put into your goals that and, and understanding when you hit the ground in New York because of the overwhelming nature of the United Nations complex, you better have a good idea of what you're doing or you'll just go in circles. So to the day that I, every day when I arrive at the UN, my preparation started the night before and I would already know who, if I had a team of people, I would establish who's going to the main plenary sessions, which is where all the countries, that's what you see on TV, with the big UN General Assembly Hall and countries flipping on their mic and, and giving a statement. People need to be there, but you need to send somebody, have decided in advance side events, parallel events. We talked at length about those, and UVU is sponsoring a parallel event, and that's a great opportunity to get your message out, your goal. Um, know who's going to go to each one of those things and mission visits. I don't know. Have you started? Um, during the whole, all the one mission we have in mind. You already have a commitment from someone at a mission yeah, for a mission. Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan. And working on another one or two. Okay. Try to make lots of phone calls, lots of fax, lots of emails to get that. And then here, here's what I would say: work with one person. If you can get to the ambassador's assistant, oh yeah, well, that's probably the best contact in there, but stay with one person. Get their name, get their number, keep calling them, keep calling them until you get an appointment. Um, they, I will send the mission visit guidelines for you so you can have a more structured visit, if that, that would be helpful. Um, so you're going to be plenary, side events, parallel events, um, mission visits. Um, too late for an exhibition, but you know what? Briefing. For, for an exhibition? For, briefing. Oh, and the briefings. Um, in the mornings, the CSW NGO committee, which is, a, I just refer to it as a super NGO, it's a conglomerate of NGOs, holds a caucus meeting briefing, and within that briefing you will hear is that the one at 8.30? That's morning? the one at 8.30. And they have a different topic that they try to address each morning, and they'll bring in, as I mentioned, speakers yeah, from some of the... one on Wednesday at 8.30 in the morning. For your group, and since you're there for just the three days, is that about what it is? You, you're just 
taking a taste of everything that's there and getting an understanding of what's going. Who, who is presenting at your parallel event? Do you have um, students? We, uh, by the way, we own in your center. It's in there? Yes, but uh, we try to get uh, everybody there, but uh, during a couple of weeks we now start to decide, because otherwise uh, we will There's not enough time. time right. An hour and 15 minutes is not very much time. The good news on a parallel event, which parallel events take place outside of the UN, and kind of along First Avenue, along that um, street there, and then side events are inside the UN. And where was I going with that? What did you just ask me? By the way, side events we have at the, the room is called the uh, oh. And it's a small room. The, there's a there's a big conference table in it. It's well, it's probably half the size of this room. So that's why not you have just You will not have a, You have an hour and a half in one hour. Side events, you're right, are an hour and 15 minutes, parallel events are one hour and a half. So it's a little bit longer. Part of what happens with a, a side event inside the UN, because they're sponsored by countries, there's a protocol that needs to be followed in that you need to introduce, make the introductions, the ambassador or their representative should be given at least three or four minutes yes. to make a presentation. And, yeah, and the moderator. Now you found out that Uzbekistan also co-sponsored two. Yeah, so you'll have two. See, that's going to eat up a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. But, but it, it's so much better. And you know what's interesting about side events? It gives you a bit of bragging rights, so to speak. You can say you presented at the UN, inside the UN. Mm -hmm. And you can say, as a student, if you're the lucky one that gets to present, that looks great on a CV or resume. That, that is... Yeah, play that one up because that, that is a big deal. <laughs> and it will be recorded to some of them. I don't know, the small ones maybe know. Are you talking about webcast on the UN system? I doubt that. Did they tell you? They said in, uh, in an announcement that uh, the majority of this will be live broadcasted by the UN system. I'm trying to remember if there's even equipment in that room to do it. It may be. It's expensive. If you have a webcast, it, it about doubles the price. So be prepared for that. Oh, we have some kind of cheap <laughs> The UN is um, very disorienting, and CSW, as compared with some of the other commissions, there's three main commissions every year, one in February, March, and April, CSOC-D, or Commission on Social Development, and then the Commission on the Status of Women, and CPD. Um, 6,000, primarily women, Gentlemen, get prepared. This this is women's week at the. No, it's cool. What if they wear wigs? No, no, no. <laughs> no, and don't be afraid to speak. And sometimes when you're in a room with all of all of those women from all over, and they come dressed in their um, cultural attire, and it's it's just it's beautiful. It's very very interesting and very fun. Um, but there is a lot going on, a lot of moving parts. A lot of the events are scattered around New York. I noticed that there was a new venue that's cleared down on Fifth Avenue, which I've never seen before, and that's, that's a walk. Bring your walking shoes for sure. Um, be ready to put in a lot of miles. There, logis logistics wise, there's just some tips and things that I'll send in a, in a training manual format so that you can get a little bit better idea. But did you tell me where you're staying? We're staying at different hotels. You're all over? Yeah. Close to the UN, but not the same place. Yeah, much as a tips because they only have very good generation. Okay. Yeah, we can help you with that. Make sure that works out. But I I don't know what since I already went through this morning is questions, some of you folks that weren't there, is there anything that I might It's like, oh. Uh, and, and so I don't really have any questions for you, but I'll probably uh, pick 
When did you graduate? Um, I actually graduated. I defended um, my capstone this summer, and then I'm done. That's it. Probably one of the most surprising things to me is the chaotic nature of the UN. If we picture at it as this very orderly, everyone sits around and has pleasant conversation. There's actually a lot of friction, a lot of competing agendas, and that, that shows up primarily in the language of the documents, but there, there are value sets that, that compete for time, and, and one of the interesting things is we, we think in terms, especially here in the United States, of an orderly constitutional system. There is no such thing within the UN system. They do Robert's Rules of Order type formatting, but the rules change. So with every, you never quite know what's going to happen, and it could be one year it will come down one way and the process of getting a document through will be consistent with what you've seen the year before, but then it will change the next year. And honestly, the bigger countries, the more developed countries manipulate the, the smaller, less developed countries in a very big way, um, in the sense that they are held hostage to funding. If they want their aid, mm -hmm. they know they have to perform and say and, and agree, because consensus is everything. You need everyone in all 193 member states need to agree on a 40-page document. How you get there? Is, is not often pretty because there's a lot of behind the scenes negotiation and a lot of arm twisting. So the developing countries are at a dis disadvantage. Um, they, are, they are seeking money and, and for obvious reasons, but the more developed countries ideologically impose their opinions upon them as the price of getting the aid. And so that undercurrent is everywhere and then the disordered the nature of it because there's no written rules. I think for the most part the UN developed as it went. Mm -hmm. I mean there there were the foundational UN charter, there were all the documents, but it's it's just this evolving, changing, wonderful thing that is looking for solutions to the world's problems. But here's the biggest problem. What is a solution for a very poverty stricken, less developed country? developing country, that solution applied in the developing world is problematic. It becomes extreme in that venue and in that arena. So there is no one-size-fits-all solution and the UN, just by nature of it, imposes one-size solutions on, or tries to, on problems. Mm -hmm. And that, that is always a challenge. And, and the intent is always good. People who come there come with the intent of helping. The breakdown comes when how do you help? My solution might be different than yours. And I'm convinced my solution is right, you're convinced yours is. And so what, situ what solution it will prevail? Why it's also important, for example, for you to interact? Yeah, now you know that uh, one of the important ways how to do NGOs, you could go to get to the United Nations. And uh, uh, for example, you could now get a contact with the uh, Russia. In the future, if you do the civil society, go in this way, this is exactly a great way chance for you to uh, get involved in advocacy, be independent from the, some of the bureaucratic structures. One really great thing is the UN is very approachable. So much more. You can have more influence within the UN system than I can have down at, I'm from Arizona, that down in Phoenix at the State House, mm -hmm. uh, at the Capitol. I can have more influence at the UN. The people are more approachable. You can get to the decision makers, the policy makers, much easier. So in that regard, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's really quite amazing. The, the stakes are significantly higher. Um, I, and as I say that, most of the UN commissions, documents, and, and the international law that's coming out of there is not enforceable, so you could argue that, no, it, it's kind of meaningless. There's no teeth behind this, which is, I think, what you were alluding to. It's kind of frustrating because, really, at the end of the day, what can the UN do? Unless it's a treaty and the UN can apply sanctions mm -hmm. to a country, but even that's contingent upon all the, all the countries participating 
in enforcing the sanctions. So if, if a country sanctioned and other countries ignore the UN, so you've just, you've got a very different animal. So if you're used to a more structured, by the law, um, governed by constitution kind of government and, and structure, you're not gonna find that there. But there are advantages to that as well. So lots of them, you just have to figure out how to understand the system and use it in a way that best suits. You go there with an agenda, UVU, Mountain, Sustainable Mountain Group is, has goals and an agenda. That's not a negative word. You, you can put your agenda forward much, much more easily if you're, if you're organized, if you capitalize on opportunities. You know, unfortunately today we are missing uh, Lady Jian. She is marvelous. Eh? The, uh, lady uh, from Taiwan, but uh, uh, she was able to register for your own NGO. And two years ago, it's uh, already uh, worse than the uh, Can you imagine? You know, Wendy Zhang and, and Utah um, China FISH was a, actually a really unusual situation. I, I was involved with Wendy getting her accreditation, helped her through, actually wrote a fair amount of that application. But I, it, was, it is rare that, this is to your question, that a group can get through in a year. It's really very unusual. And it's a case of you don't want to raise any red flags. You give them just enough information to get past that NGO committee that gives approval, but don't give them too much that they might get nervous. So, but Wendy got through in a year, and I don't know how she did it other than we just kept her real low profile. So that's what I would suggest for you guys. Just keep it really vague. Yeah, there's a way to do it, so. Um, I, I would tell you, walk into those negotiations. I mentioned to you, you can't get in. Younger people can get in. Here's, I, I mean, I walk in and it's like, you're out of here. But young people can walk in because, number one, they look like they're assistants. They look like they're the interns or the aides. And I hate to tell you this, but I mean, here's my subversive nature. <laughs> I'll take some of the students and just position them in a crowd of people and <laughs> say, just walk in, act like, like you, you know what you're doing. And you just go in and you, then you can experience that. If I could get you all into a negotiation, I would have you do that because that is really amazing to watch, to see how that all is done. And I don't want to get you thrown out of there, but I would say try and walk in. All they're going to do is say, uh, let me see your badge, and they'll say, no, 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 you're not supposed to be in here. Say, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'll walk out. But, you know, 20 years of trying to beat the system here, <laughs> you do. Do you want my list? I Last year, uh, uh, Wendy sent it to me, I said, oh, great. No. I just uh, uh, selected which one uh, liked it, and it was really great. We went to our from, the, from the list that I had narrowed down? And by the way, we have here Sarah. She already knows that uh, uh, one of the um, guys from the, I, I'm mm -hmm. from BYU, Matt, will uh, have a parallel event on Saturday. Yeah. Who is it? Uh, so um, it's actually my roommate's aunt is with Women's Stats. So oh, all right. Yeah, they have a big presence. Is Valerie going? I don't, think, I don't know who Valerie is, but I think the other one that co-founded it, Matthew something maybe? I don't know who that is, but they will no, be there. Matt, he, he was uh, one of the assistants uh, a couple of years ago, and we know him. Oh, okay. But no, probably still, still. They yeah, they're doing a But staff. Valerie maybe will be not. They have a parallel event that they're doing? Interesting yeah. to see there is no sign, no BYU, nothing, no women's start. They just uh, code it in. Yeah, I looked and there's nothing that says BYU. I, yeah, I I've not understood exactly. BYU BYUI has been heavily involved for another number of years. BYU Provo, not so much, not so much at all. I mean, James Carroll, is it James Carroll? Jason Carroll. Do you know Jason? He's so, um, social sciences at BYU. He presented. Uh, I, were you there? That was two years ago. But that's about the extent of BYU's involvement. And whether it had some been a couple, a couple of times, but just... Yeah, I've never seen Valerie there. That doesn't mean she hasn't been there, but... And I saw that uh, last year, guys from the... Uh, not only BYU, 
Ukraine on the problem from uh, Weber. From where? Uh, Weber State. From Weber. That, that I don't know. Yeah. Well, so that's why maybe you, you recommend us who else? I'll get you a list and. Usually, with I, I do my list of things that I'm interested in, or I, that I want reports on, that I want to know what's said, and then I tell the students. Then you go through the list too. I mean, just because I think it needs to be looked at. I was explaining that when I look at this, it's giant. It's like oh, I don't know how many hundred parallel events in that two-week period. Massive. I'm looking at organizations more than titles of these events. Because they, and I do it myself, as I said, I, I, can, I can tweak those words and make it sound really good to get it past whomever's making those decisions. But it's, the tell is in who is sponsoring it. And what UN agency might be sponsoring a side event, that tells me as well. So I will get you a list, but it's, it's my brain, it's my filter. So you decide. Okay, I, I can connect you with that. Can you at board meeting? Yes. Oh, okay. So I was just wondering about how the students are actually structuring their presentation and what it should look like. So okay. I want to show you what we're Yeah, I would love to. I would be happy to take a look at that and maybe give some input on what might not be as appropriate or... Yeah, we're kind of, I feel like we're a little fly by the seat of our pants as far as like what we want the actual presentation to be. Is this for the side event? Parallel events are much more flexible. I mean, anybody, you don't even have to be ECOSOC accredited to do a parallel event, which... found out two weeks, a week ago, we can have But you know, at the same time, the trick, even if you are not uh, ECOSOC accredited, when you are applying for the parallel event, the they do. They just do, yeah. And whoever decide, makes the decisions on those parallel events is completely non arbitrary. They're, it's non transparent and there's no rhyme or reason. It's ideologically driven. So just know that. But I would think with the Russian Academy, isn't that how you applied? Was with. We put all of them, Russian. See, I would think that would that would slide you right under. Yeah, that should get you in. And, and later, when uh, Veronica asked me, why we didn't include the UV, I said, I have not, but okay, if you will include the UV, probably the guys look at it and say, what kind of UV? Yeah, I have, I, transparency is a huge problem at the UN. Um, Fifteen years ago, you could walk into pretty much any meeting, and in fact, they prided themselves on transparency. But it's, that's changed now. Um, the UN was remodeled about seven, eight years ago. They started and they moved everyone in, if you've ever been on the UN complex, into this metal building kind of thing. It was actually quite a nice metal building, but we were in there for about three years. And because it was smaller spaces, they said, oh, there's no room for the gallery for NGOs to come in and watch the negotiations. So they closed everyone out with that excuse. But interestingly, now that that building, we're back in the main complex and it's all been remodeled and the, and the building and the rooms are large, nothing changed. No one, but it's catch-22. The diplomats actually don't want NGOs in the negotiations. They, they feel the pressure from it, but you have... The, no transparency. We don't know what is going on. So I, probably in a way that makes their job easier, but that's not the purpose. If this is the world's forum, mm -hmm. it should be the world's forum. And th there's some campaigns being mounted to, to push that back on that and to get the NGOs back into the negotiations. But that, that's, that's where the sausage is made in. That is, it's fascinating to watch. Very, very interesting. Do you have your own Pardon me? Do you have your own you know what, we didn't, United Families did not even try for events this year. We just said, oh, we're, we're just going to sit this. We tried to get some side events, and we had one real close with Kenya and Nigeria, and then it fell through. So we just said, you know what, there's enough going on. We'll do it. But I saw in 2016, your statement was there many other things. 
Our statement, yeah. We submitted a statement, but we didn't get a side event. Is that what you're talking about? Did, did you ask me? Yeah. Oh, yes, Amy. Yes, the Native American. Yeah, now we need to proceed with our colleagues and... Uh, yeah, we need, we need to... I see. I would, yeah, I would like to see what you're thinking, so... He gave uh, the name of that uh, person who is from distinguished one, from maybe local tribes, and he was... Right. The rural women, every commission and the three main ones, every year has a different theme. They have a priority theme, they'll have a review theme. So you will, s review is basically what they did a year ago, and you will see topically those things addressed. Yeah, so this year it's about rural women. What was last year? I can't even remember. Well, I can't remember what it was. You'll see some events on that, and that's great. Some events are, some themes, topics for the, the commissions are more conducive to your issues. And when, when it is conducive, boy, you, you do lots of stuff. And we were just grateful for your connection with the sustainable mountain women and mountain peoples because that fits so well under the rural. We just didn't even try. They, it's really, yeah. I, and I, I have no input or secret tips or advice on that. It's just relationships. Yeah. Yeah. It's just you know how I'm upset due to all the marrows. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of his personality. The the events run from early in the morning till eight at night. I mean, you literally could go <laughs> all day long, nonstop, and be very organized and strategic because you will spend a lot of time going in and out and getting through security. We were just talking about that. Yeah, just experience all the different segments. Mm -hmm. and, and then each year you will just get better and better at putting forward your message we'll and training. And you'll get more opportunities and more people to present. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you, you students here, w would you want to speak? Yeah. 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 Well, so I don't know. That young people, um, young adults at the UN really do get preferential treatment. If, if, I, if I could choose, I needed to meet with an ambassador or a diplomat, if I had a young person that I could take with me or even send them, yeah, they'll listen. They'll listen much better. It's a real plus. So the UN is geared towards young people. They want, well, they want young people involved and in the system. It's your world, and they want your input on how things go forward. Anything else? I, I, I talked nonstop this morning, so I could, I could start over again. I spilled everything in my head this morning. It's very insightful, and I really appreciate it. Very helpful, yeah. I'm trying to think what some of the other nuances or surprises to me of the UN. I have a question. Yes. You have eight eight thirty on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. Here, <laughs> no, it's eight thirty. Well, the, the Monday, the first Monday, we have the the. It's at eleven thirty. Here's the challenges of, of that Monday morning, and it's we really big. Yeah, I don't even know how you're going to do that. We will go at eight thirty eight in the morning to the. Registration. I don't they do that. The doors at nine. I was going to say they don't even open until nine, so. But well, we're going to wait time outside. Same thing. We were first in line, and it took for us one hour to get inside. Still. And you were first. Two. Okay, there is there is a system for side events. Your Bosnia should be able to get you passes. It's the oddest thing to me. For example, 
Oh yeah, so this is how it works. If I RSVP'd to a site event, okay, listen, listen, and the, the mission, the country, so in your case, Bosnia, should have, I, I don't know how much time in advance, they can take a list, they'll take names, and here's how it works. So, the, so Bosnia will take all the names of the people that want to come to this, whether they have a badge or not. You don't even have to have a badge. And they will produce a list, send it to security, and on the morning, on Monday morning, someone from Bosnia would have a stack of paper tick tickets. They're just little pieces, about twice the size of this, just pieces of paper. And you walk up to them, they'll hold a sign that'll say 8.30, the title of it, and you walk up, and they check you off, hand you this little square piece of paper, and that's as good as my UN badge to get inside the UN. In fact, if you have people who aren't accredited, that's one good way to get inside the UN. You can RSVP to a site event, get your name on the list, pick up your ticket, enter through security. Once you're in, you better stay in because you're not coming back in. So at the end of the day, you have to leave, but that's one way to get inside the UN without having formal badge. You remember that uh, Liliana sent us this... Uh, I'll see you at four. Said, uh, did, they, did they send you paper? Uh, please, uh, uh, here. You Maybe really... Uh, don't have the budget. Maybe we need to send it You need to put everyone's name in. There's... Uh, entrance, but then we'll get out and... Uh, uh, and that will give us oh absolutely you need I didn't even think about that I thought you were coming earlier next uh, morning we need 830 we will be at the parallel but we need to get registered they they still do badges I think they're open on Sunday during CSW no, Sunday, no. no? But they're open on Saturday correct no. are you sure no it said that there are closed uh, Saturday and Sunday the first week they're open. They're open. Okay, that's what I'm thinking because I was going to oh, say I've got my badge on. Side. We're talking about this is a huge big deal because it's very painful when you have six thousand people. Everything's aligned and to get in, but that's one way to bypass the system. You know, it's my subversive nature here. <laughs> Figure out all the loopholes. It, yeah, it's a little bit faster, but still, you're not going to get in. The office doesn't even open to 9. Your event's at 8.30. How are you going to get a people no, in? it's 11.30. It's 11.30? Yeah, yes. we're going to get there at 8.30. Oh, so. I thought it was at 8.30. All right. Well, that's, that's on Tuesday. That's Tuesday's event? So but that's the parallel inside. event. Okay, then I'm mistaken. Okay. Do you see guys next time when we decide Again. But uh, when you have knowledgeable people, 